my event at Heidelberg AI. Um, pleased to see so many people joining us on a Tuesday night after work. Um, so a little disclaimer for those of you who don't know us. Um, we are sponsored or hosted by the Medical Image Computing Group at the German Cancer Research Center, well, Professor Klaus Meyer Hein. And um, we're working with uh, deep learning and medical images. And I'm saying that because uh, just recently we helped to found a new graduate school together with the uh, Heidelberg University and also the KIT in Karlsruhe. And right now we have 12 open PhD positions and the deadline is in February. So if you about to finish your master, uh, you should definitely check this out and uh, maybe apply for uh, one of our positions. And um, if you want more info, you can just talk to us after the event or check out the Helmholtz Science Research, <laughs> research yeah, School uh, for Health Applications. It's Hits for Health. Hits for Health. If you can H I B S S. Yeah. All right. And after the event, don't uh, run away. We'll order a lot of pizza and we need you to help us eat it. Um, so uh, maybe. Uh, you and Omar will also uh, stay for a little while longer and you can um, ask him more questions. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'm very uh, glad to introduce to you Björn Omar. He's uh, the head of the computer vision group at Heidelberg University. And he's also one of the directors of the HCI. And we're uh, very pleased to have him. So he's gonna tell us about self-supervision tonight. So please give us a warm applause for Björn Omar. Hello everyone, it's so great to see so many of you. Um, I guess we met at a talk in a totally different avenue, like in, in Karlsruhe, which was more directed to people in the humanities and there was giving an entirely sort of different speech. Today uh, I wanted, like, uh, especially considering the audience here, give it uh, in a uh, somewhat more technical sense. So who of you do have a background in machine learning, computer vision or the like? Whoa. -ho. Who of you do have a background in life sciences? Oh, also quite a few. Okay, and who of you have neither of the two? <laughs> okay, <laughs> almost none. So, um, today I want to talk about how we can teach machines, how they can teach themselves. As you know, learning is the key sort of to open up visual content, to open up um, the the contents that are there within big data and learning is, is the key, but having machines learn themselves how they can actually learn from this data is really where I want to go today. So a bit of an overview of this talk. I'd like to start talking about um, how we can learn, how we can teach machines, how they can teach themselves self-supervision. I'd like to discuss with you how we can do some very specific learning, and that is learning similarities, metrics, as one uh, says, from a mathematical point of view, um, posture and behavior analysis as an applica application of that, and then going to a more sort of diverse application, uh, particularly in the neurosciences, but also industry, which is on behavior analysis, what that is and what this is good for, I'm going to show in a short while. And then, last but not least, I will give a bit of an overview over um, applications uh, related to context-aware um, editing of images and alteration of content. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So let's really start at the, at the far beginning. Roughly 100 years ago, psychophysics was dominated by Gestalt psychology. And Gestaltists like Wertheimer, Köhler and Kofka ask very profound uh, questions regarding visual content. And one of them was, why do things actually look the way that they do? And with that, they did not want to figure out like why an artist has painted something the way that, it, that they did, why a scene was constructed the way that it is, but really, how comes that our brain can see the things that it sees in the way that it actually perceives them. And there are some very profound peculiarities there. So why do we see things which are actually not there, like Kanitsa's triangle, uh, seeing this invisible triangle that you have here? And why there are certain things, like the elephant in the room, that we don't see, although it is actually there? So how comes that these things work the way that they do? Um, 
you go a bit further, you see that one of the answers to that question is that recognition image understanding is actually much more than observing pixels. So if I give you this image here, which is somewhat dark because <laughs> of the contrast of this projector, uh, you cannot see much. Um, let's see if we can see a bit more with context. Does not work. Um, so what, what you were supposed to see here is something which is horizontally aligned. And in this context of the scene, this actually happens to be a car. Now, if I take the same pattern that you have here and turn this at 90 degrees vertically some, and place it somewhere else, what used to be the car beforehand, now in that scene actually becomes a pedestrian. So depending on location in a scene, the same visual pattern, depending on orientation, the same visual pattern plays the role of entirely different content. Now, for our brain to make sense of the visual world out there, outside the window that it has, um, for a brain to be capable of doing that, it has to actually solve a very complicated inverse problem. Understanding the scene which is out there, uh, understanding things like depth ordering of the scene, understanding a depth ordering of this scene that we have here, understanding the contents and so on, is a tricky problem. It's not directly apparent to your brain what this scene actually looks like and reconstructing all of that just from the pixels that are, are out there is tricky. So why are we capable of doing that in the first place? It turns out that our bait, our world, looks somewhat chaotic, that there is a high degree of structure a high degree of order out there in our visual world. So regardless which scale you're at, what scale you're looking at the outside world, if it's your microscope, your bare eyes, or a telescope, there's a high degree of order, regularity, structure. And only that allows you to go into a new room where you haven't been beforehand, sit down on this thing that we actually call chair, and know how to deal with this thing, although you haven't seen that particular chair beforehand. So this allows us to see patterns in the world, to understand these patterns, and then make sense of them. This allows what we call learning, what we call machine learning to actually work. And the predominant, dominating way to actually learn from such data has been, especially with neural networks, deep models that try to make sense of content, has been end-to-end -end learning using heavy supervision. What does that mean? The network, the model that you want to learn, that's supposed to make sense of the world out there, is here, within this black box. It's essentially a function which maps the input, the images, to the explanation of the scene. And this mapping, f of x here, is then trained in an end-to-end -end manner, meaning I stuff millions of images in here, and for each of these images I do have a label. I know what this image is supposed to tell me. We can do the same thing with, um, with segmentations. So I put a segmentation, uh, I, I put an image in here and stuff the segmentation in here and then my model in one way or another makes sense of the world and learns this mapping. Now this has been great and this has been the driving power of most of deep learning over the last six years or whatever. The issue that I've seen and the thing that has been sort of propelling um, much of research in my group is that um, images and videos are actually cheap and they are growing at a staggering rate if you just look over time. However, the process of labeling there, despite recent efforts by the industry, is still costly. And so we ask ourselves, can't we <coughs> design an approach which can leverage all of this data without requiring this costly labeling down there? So can't I just take my brain here and have it just learn by watching the images without having somebody to tell for each individual image what the content actually there is. And um, based on my other life, which is in the Department of Humanities and our collaboration with um, uh, art historians and so on, you can see what the profound questions are that you could learn from these large amounts of visual data. <coughs> One of them is taking images 
and trying to understand what makes them similar. And it turns out this question of learning similarities between images, learning about their dissimilarities, is actually something which is very important for all of machine learning and computer vision as well. So if I know visual similarity, this helps me for object detection tasks, image categorization tasks, grouping data together, and a lot of other tasks. All of these have in common that I need to learn what makes data, what makes visual data similar. Now, how can we learn a metric and what does it actually mean to learn a metric, to learn a distance? It turns out that if you provide it with a large number of data, for instance, visual data here, there it's easier to see, you might have additional constraints which you want to build in, or there are things that you might want to learn from this data. For instance, that these two faces here come from the same person, or these two images come from the same person, and others, like these here, show different persons. Now, metric learning in that case would mean that I want to map all of this visual data here into a new space where things which are similar, similar persons for instance, end up being nearby and things which are dissimilar end up being far away. So metric learning in one way or another amounts to either learning a similarity directly or mapping the data into a new space by means of this mapping here so that in this target space, simple Euclidean norm or something like actually suffices. There have been a lot of approaches for learning metrics and um, they have typically in common that they require either supervision information or that they require at least a lot of pre-training or um, supervised approaches at the end to actually fine-tune the models, so fine-tuning on a lot of labeled data. Um, similarly, there have been approaches that try to sort of do away with that, but they were built on um, kind of a straightforward way towards metric learning or learning of similarities, and that are the CMA style networks. So if you want to learn the similarity between two patches, you have a network architecture which takes both patches in, brings them into some representational space, and then you hope that for similar patches you end up with a representation which tells you, hey, they are similar. This is all fair and well. The problem is just you have tuples here meaning there are O of n squared tuples that you could conceive and they need a lot of data. So training time for this approach here by Dorsch was really weeks. And we ask ourselves, can't we do away with the tuples? Can't we do it just in O of n time, so to speak? And um, we then came up with this approach which took individual data points and was seeking an embedding, a representation in some space so that samples that are supposed to be similar end up nearby. And in this case, it means for us that samples which are similar are supposed to get the same label. Now, you might interrupt me and say, like, what label? I thought you're doing it in an unsupervised manner. And that's precisely the point. We don't have this label. We just framed it that way. We, we said we stuff in the image at the beginning. We learn, we try to learn a representation so that samples which are similar are classified with the same label but we don't have this label, so we like to learn this mapping and we like to learn the labels that we want to attach to these images at the same time. So just to be clear here, the setting that I now want to look at is a setting where we learn without supervision, where we don't have any pre-training going on, no model provided, and we want to still learn fine-grained similarities, fine-grained similarities in posture, for instance. So despite these persons here having different identity, wearing different clothing, different background clutter and so on, you see that they share a very similar posture, and that's precisely what we want to learn without any supervision information. Now, in so doing, we observed that many of these models actually share an issue, or all of these models for metric learning share the same problem. Let's say I take a query sample here, and then take all the other data that I have and order that according to its similarity with respect to this query. What do I observe? When I do this ordering, I always observe this sigmoid shape here in terms of the similarity distribution. Now, what's so tricky about this? It means that there are very few samples which are highly related. Very few samples where I can easily tell that they're definitely dissimilar. But the majority of samples are somewhere in between. Neither close nor far. And all of them 
are very nearby, their similarity with respect to the query and that of their neighbor is really close, meaning like the ordering is, is really tricky to actually achieve. So at the end, for only very few samples, I know that they're similar to the query. For only very few, I know that they're dissimilar, and dissimilar, and for the majority, I know nothing. If you go for the pairwise similarity matrix, this then becomes really an issue they become this mushy color between red and um, blue. Most of them are kind of squeezed out. So in this case, <coughs> uh, we took here um, a long jump sequence ordered according to time. So you have the person like starting to run, pick up some pace, and then eventually at this point you jump, uh, fly through the air, and then land in the sand pit. Uh, what you're supposed to see here in the on the off diagonal is repetitions in posture. So if I do a posture, repeat, 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 yeah, then you see off-diagonal elements here. And they're getting closer together just because the person is accelerating. So this is happening faster and faster and faster. But you can see that you don't see too much because the similarity is kind of disturbed because everything is so mushy in an orange tint somewhere in between. When learning a similarity, therefore, we are facing an issue. That means that I take my data points here and want to learn a mapping so that this even uh, eventually gives rise to a similarity. Now, mathematically, the issue is that we're actually living in a, a topological space. We're not living in a uniform space with a uniformity assumption. Uniformity assumption actually cannot be made. And um, this is a prerequisite for that actually being a valid metric, let alone like this being a Euclidean metric. So since we're just since we're lacking this uniformity assumption, um, this is not good for giving us an overall similarity, and that's why we are it's why it's only partially defined. And the other result of this problem is that we are lacking transitivity relationships. So let's say A is a friend of B, B is a friend of C. In this case, without transitivity, A and C might not get uh, together pretty well. Um, and in order to solve this problem, Getting the transitivity in there again, A and B can go together, B and C, but A and C also need to sort of be forced to get along with another. We then proposed this idea that we called clique CNN. So we wanted from the very beginning to make sure that um, the similarities, that the transitivities of these similarities are actually obeyed. So how do we do that? We start off establishing surrogate groups, compact cliques, where all samples are mutually similar. So in essence, we sample from these parts here of the similarity distribution and even like a more restricted uh, part of that. So, yeah, so just a tiny part of our data, I mean this is much larger than what it actually is, so if blue is all the data, just a tiny part of the data, a compact clique we actually get. Now this just gives me the similarities. How do I get the dissimilarities in there? I need to establish several cliques here, which are all mutually dissimilar. Once I have that, I have reliable similarities, few, but at least these are reliable. And I do have reliable dissimilarities between these cliques. Now, this is all nice, but the problem is I have covered only a tiny fraction of my data. Deep learning needs a lot of data, so how do I get more data in there? I need more cliques. Great, well, just sample more compact cliques. The issue with that, however, is that many of these cliques here are both close and far, or the members within these cliques are both close and far at the same time. And in that case, we don't have reliable similarities anymore. So what can you do? We figured that we can actually partition the set of cliques into subsets, uh, here by means of color. And all the cliques within one subset, same color, are all mutually dissimilar. The points within the cliques are mutually similar, all reliable. And then you hop from subset to subset, and each subset is clear. In each subset, you know what similarities, what dissimilarities are. So in essence, we split the unreliable relationships be over or distribute them over different subsets so that each subset you know what to do. You have reliable similarities, reliable dissimilarities. It's a little bit like juggling. 
If you have more than two balls which you want to hold in your hand, you can only hold two at the same time. Well, you just juggle the rest of them. And at any given time, you only have reliable similarities. In this case, balls that you can hold in your hand. You do have them. And then you hop from one set to the other, so that if you do this often enough, it appears like you're holding all of them here in your hands. So, in short, the approach. Um, we establish compact, cl compact cliques, giving us these reliable similarities. Um, we split the data into batches, into these subsets, um, where we only have reliable relationships, reliable similarities, reliable dissimilarities. These subsets become the batches of our stochastic gradient descent for training the neural network. And then all the cliques in such a set are supposed to be mutually dissimilar and at the same time, this is this one thing that's missing, we want to maximize the coverage. We want to make sure that the cliques overall cover as much of the data as possible. Data is costly or data is important. I want to have all the data covered. So we formulated this as a large optimization problem where all of these constraints come in, maximizing the coverage, making sure that each individual group is rel reliable, that each batch is also uh, containing only reliable similarities and dissimilarities. And then once you have partitioned things, then you can learn a representation based on the surrogate labels that come out and you start building the compact groups again and this thing goes on and on. What you can do with that is, given a query frame, learn which frames are similar without any annotations, without any labels during training. So you have a person here running, for instance, and you have others in a very similar posture. You can go across data sets where you're typically lacking um, labels and take a person having, I don't know, this posture here in one data set, here entirely different activity uh, and still similar posture, figure out that although these persons here wear entirely different clothing, look different, they share the same posture. And you can go beyond posture, and here we took Pascal VOC, image classification, try to do this in an entirely unsupervised manner. Now this is a really tricky problem, that's why you cannot expect to have perfect performance, and sure enough, I mean, that's not perfect, but you in that case learn the similarity, given a query sample, what other frames look similar to the model. No ImageNet pre-training, as has been done beforehand, no uh, sort of post fine-tuning or anything of that sort. You just stuff the data in and learn relationships. And if we go back to the learned similarities that we had at the start um, with these mushy <coughs> distributions, this what th is what then comes out. Uh, nice stripes where you can much more crisply see where similar postures are. And you can do transfer learning on to, uh, from labeled data sets also uh, to an unlabeled data set and uh, many more things. Now, we've extended this approach in a lot of different ways. For instance, utilize relationships that Click CNN so far did not utilize um, uh, by incorporating a post set loss. So, the essential idea there is that we utilize partial ordering constraints uh, much more than uh, what has been done in Click CNN beforehand. But this would definitely go beyond the scope of this talk. So, if you're interested, we can surely take this offline and discuss more about this later on. So we then ask ourselves, self-supervision is great, uh, self -supervision is great but uh, is this really the end? How can you improve self-supervision further? And for that, we first of all really have to understand how self-supervision works. So learning from unlabeled data typically requires what's called surrogate tasks. Extra tasks that don't directly or aren't directly related with the task that you want to solve, but are in one way or another helpful for solving this task. So let's say I want to learn a really complicated activity. What could be complicated? Something like juggling chainsaws or something of that sort. So you better not start with this task right away, right? I mean, you're probably not going to make it to the end and never become expert because you die beforehand. So what do we do? We start with something very basic. Yeah? You just roll around some, some oranges or something like that, toss them around, maybe you start juggling them or something like that at a later age, and then you've picked up a lot of skills from this task that help you with this task, with learning this task later on. And we've observed that a lot of these surrogate tasks actually share 
that they are ordering tasks. Ordering task in the sense that you take an image, you tile it into pieces, and then you shuffle these pieces along, uh, like a jigsaw. And for a neural network to be capable to turn this here into this again, to figure out how to solve this jigsaw, the neural network has to understand a lot about image content. So in essence, by trying to recover what we had here originally, the neural network learns to understand the image. Um, PhD students in my group figured out that much of these surrogate tasks are actually related by being ordering tasks. So the same thing that you can do in a spatial sense, you can also do in a temporal sense. You take a video, just shuffle the frames, and you learn to bring them back into the right order. All of these are ordering tasks. Now, the interesting thing is that all of these tasks and many more actually do have an issue, besides being nice and, and uh, a helpful way to actually solve self-supervision, they share the problem that they do have free parameters. And that these free parameters so far have just been adjusted in a random manner. Meaning somebody just chose to show the network random transformations and then have the network learn from random transformations how to recover them and learn about images. Now, when I was learning to play tennis as a little kid, my trainer did something nasty. He always played me on my bad hand. When I was good at forehand, played me on backhand. When I was good at backhand, played me on the forehand. Now what appeared to be nasty for me then, I now figure out that he did this on a purpose because he was a good trainer. Now the way that we train our networks here in one way or another looks stupid. We just serve them randomly, forehand, backhand, forehand, backhand. We don't observe where they're good and then serve the other hand. And that's exactly what we try to do here. We incorporated a reinforcement learning approach which tries to figure out the optimal tasks for training the network at hand. So we want to figure out where our network's currently screwing up to then serve it more of these ordering tasks for the problems where it actually screws up. So reinforcement learning means we need an environment. The environment is essentially the images which are getting shuffled and our network which learns the representation to unshuffle these images and from that learn about the content. It means that we need a policy. A policy which proposes how the images are shuffled. A policy network which previously used to be just permute the images at random. Now we do have a network which we can learn which comes up with a better policy than doing this in a random manner. And then comes finally what's here called validation, a network which evaluates this network to figure out where it has screwed up to adjust the policy and say like, hey, you need to come up with other permutations to improve this network here in the middle. So this is a reinforcement learning approach which has the previous approach of learning from ordering tasks in the center and the reinforcement learning wrapped around which tells how to better improve the learning from these surrogate tasks. Now, how we actually learn this RL part goes much into details and we can take this offline if you're interested um, based on uh, policy gradients here um, and the approach um, surely improves on a whole set of tasks. It's not specific to any particular task so you can utilize that for recognition of objects, detection, segmentation, action recognition here and all these tasks on, on uh, Pascal and ImageNet and, and the like. You can take again query samples and find nearest neighbors uh, and improve on, on previous approaches there. All of that works out. We then ask ourselves, however, uh, <laughs> it's nice that you do that from an individual image or an individual video, but can't you do more if you have video data? And can't you do more if you have multimodal data? If you're not just having an individual image, but if I do have two modalities, Let's say I have a video stream. A video stream has an RGB component, the individual frames that we're also used to. And in addition to that, there's a flow component. There's the change between frames. For what it's worth, you do have two different modalities. Two things which, by, by the start, from the start, looking at that, don't have anything in common. Uh, what do pixels and RGB have together with motion that you observe if you compute optical flow? Uh, it doesn't look like much. 
However, the point here that we wanted to make is if we find, if we can find some commonalities there, that would be quite a coincidence if that is not meaningful. So the point is if we can find cross-modal information, this would have high semantic meaning. If we can find information that goes across modalities, that somehow has a relationship between both of these modalities. That would be really interesting. At the same time, however, um, we want this thing to um, be invariant with respect to change or to, to, to discover changes between differences in content that we see here on the left and right side. Now, in short, that means that our features that we want to learn should be invariant to um, things which are modality specific yeah, and we want to have similar features in such a pair and we want to have dissimilar features between such a pair that shows actually different content. So we want to have features which are invariant with respect to changes between the modalities but which are dependent on changes with respect to content of the scene. And then we have really covered the content. How does the approach look like? We want to have a feature representation for one modality. We want to have a feature uh, representation for the other modality, so two encoders, which eventually map it into a space, which you see somewhere here, translated into a representation in such a space that things, although they come from a different modality, have the same feature representation here and here. So in essence, we want to minimize the differences between these encodings, which are fed an entirely different input. I hope you grasp the, <laughs> the importance of that. I mean, in come here some RGB pixels, in come here some flow representation, entirely different input, uh, totally different dimensions. So from a physics perspective, you stuff in two things which have entirely different dimensions, you translate it, that into something which becomes this lengthy FC vector here, which then hopefully lives in the same space so that although the input is entirely different, the content is still there and they are similar in terms of content. And you want to enforce dissimilarities, differences where the content is different. Yeah, having the dumper here and having this person swinging the baseball bat uh, in the other video. Now, if you apply this approach, then you can back project, it's a bit hard to see here on the screen, uh, and, and figure out like where in the image what's the support for what you've actually discovered. And sure enough, you find that this here is uh, giving like much more uh, pointed um, representation, whereas this here is uh, much more of a spurious representation, and the approach therefore also achieves much better uh, performance. It's much faster um, than what used to be there uh, beforehand. Now, um, I want to take a different angle on learning from uh, visual data and show applications in the content of posture analysis, behavior analysis, and then applications also in the neurosciences. Before I get there, is this getting a bit too cold? Yeah? <laughs> Just before you guys are all <laughs> leaving tomorrow sneezing, I want to give them opportunity okay, to close the window. Okay, cool. So. What do we need to do to get closer to visual understanding? Um, our visual world is highly complicated. And if we could disentangle it into the different components that there are, for instance, the shape that a person uh, appears in, the differences in appearance that what they actually wear, this would be profoundly helpful. It would help us also in generating new images. Now, we presented an approach last CVPR where you can take an image of one person, image of another person here, and um, you want to have, or you're now interested in a view of this person down here, sharing the appearance, the things that this person wears, the identity of this person, but observed from the viewpoint and the posture of this person. Can I do that? With just a single image down here, show this person from the viewpoint and posture that this person has. And this is exactly what this approach does. Yeah? So you see here this person now from the front. We then ask ourselves, can we do that for more? Yeah? Just observe other persons like these here. All different persons, every time a different posture, different viewpoint and so on. And render this fellow after observing just a single picture down here from different viewpoints, different postures and the like. 
And this network is exactly what does that. Now, how does it work? Um, we can all, with generative adversarial networks, take a single point here and render a single image. That all works nicely. Things start to become difficult when we actually render a lot of images. Now, then figuring out about this high diversity in this feature space and tackling the high variance in this feature space becomes really a tricky thing. However, um, when you could figure out more about the structure in this space, the process of generating these images should become much easier. Now, variations in appearance, like here, Peard Brosnan growing a beard and taking this beard away, are easy to, to handle for neural networks. And there have been a multitude of approaches recently that were capable of showing that. They just need to recolor individual pixels, and this is all great. Things become much more tricky when you want to alter the shape of a person. Moving your arms is not the same as recoloring background pixels into an arm and recoloring pixels where there's an arm into background. No, you really need to move the arm. And this is what the approaches so far were lacking. Now, students from my group did really great work in sort of extending the standard autoencoder-like approaches so that they can actually handle this framework. So let's say I take a person here, I have an encoder which learns a representation of the appearance of that person and wants to decode. This is all nice, but if you have changes in posture like before, it ain't gonna work out. So what we did is actually have here a second channel which is supposed to capture the posture in this frame and then have what's called a UNet, a model that actually has a lot of cross-links on different uh, spatial resolutions to retain the posture that it um, observed in the input here. And what we then have is a conditional rendering at the decoder side, which tries to retain the information that is here and the information that is here. Now, what do I mean with information here and here? Um, the information that's here is supposed to be the appearance. The only issue that this um, encoder down here could potentially also grasp appearance. There could still be appearance information in here. How can we prevent this from happening? Now we introduced this KL divergence here and coined this thing then a variational UNet, uh, which makes sure that down here is supposed to be no appearance information present anymore because these two representations here are supposed to be um, highly dissimilar based on their KL loss. And then you get a combination of all of these losses. And with that model, you can then take an individual point, render a person, fair enough. Uh, but you can also alter that person's posture and you can alter the person's appearance. And you can come up with all different kinds of combinations of that. Now these here are all synthesized. Yeah? They don't exist, so to speak. They are just hypothesized by the model and there are many more of them and many, many more that I could potentially show you. What's more, I can take a single appearance, a single picture of you, and then change the posture, take another video where I take postures and start just from a single image to actually start to animate that. Yeah, and turn that into a video sequence that then um, changes the posture. And you could go on and on and on with that. Now this is not limited to just persons and their posture. You can do that with many other objects as well. You could, for instance, if you're interested in finding a fitting handbag to a shoe, synthesize them as well and <laughs> lots of other things that you might be interested in. We've um, extended this approach away from just a single posture to change of posture, which you might call behavior. Uh, let me just skip this, yeah, and then you take an input video here and synthesize um, behavior from uh, using different, these are three PhD students working on this project, synthesize them into these videos without them ever having played uh, bas uh, basketball or, or, or tennis or whatever else you see there. Now, then we ask ourselves, <laughs> nice, you can synthesize images, beautiful to look at and so on, but uh, can we do something meaningful also with the learned representation? Can we utilize that for something? And how can we learn these representations now to do a very fine-grained analysis of posture, a very detailed analysis of behavior? And um, 
this is what we've done here in this project, um, uh, where, where Timur was working on, on different videos here of persons having really complicated activities that they perform, and we were interested in a low dimensional representation, or also high dimensional representation, where all of these athletes here, male, female, wearing different uh, clothing, clutter and background, all end up in the same feature space so that points which are nearby show the same posture, although them being different in their identity, different in the appearance and the clothing that they wear, so that you can come up with a concise representation of the activity that you're looking at. Now this is probably not the scope to go into too much detail of the approach. It means that we need to, uh, in an unsupervised manner, so here's no uh, supervision information involved, learn uh, correspondences between the sequences and then learn a representation um, of uh, the individual frames, of the individual posture, and then go about between both of them until we eventually sort of represented them correctly. You can, with that approach, for instance, nicely predict a su success of frames. So given a sequence, you want to predict what's next. Unfortunately, your resolution is a bit bad with this projector, but predict the next frame here or for another video sequence. And, and this has been a cooperation with uh, um, people from Bosch, um, in an automotive scenario, can you actually predict future behavior of a pedestrian. Cars going by, will the pedestrian cross? Will they actually stay where they are? Predict future behavior of the pedestrian, much like I've shown you before, and I guess you all um, see the direct need uh, that a company like Bosch working in automotive uh, has ex actually with that. Now, much of the posture and behavior analysis was actually spurred by a long-term cooperation with neuroscientists from ETH uh, Zurich, and the question that we asked there is, can we without annotation do an analysis of the behavior that's going on there, of this rat, mice, or uh, similar um, animals. And um, we've observed that a simple trajectory analysis, like is typically utilized, is insufficient. That action classification, sure, is not enough. It needs something much more fine-grained, much more detailed, to understand the subtle differences that there are between a healthy and impaired animal, or also an animal undergoing rehabilitation. So the approach takes visual data as input and wants to analyze the behavior or analyze the posture of these animals. Map them, like we've seen beforehand, into a space where you can find out the differences between correct and incorrect behavior, between impaired and healthy behavior, so that we eventually can reason about intervention, how to actually improve the intervention that's been going on. And in a series of uh, publications, starting with this earlier work in 2014 on science, uh, published in Science, we then pursued more and more detailed analysis of behavior. Now, much of that is based on what I've shown you earlier, taking a video sequence and sh uh, shuffling this real sequence and having the network learn to unshuffle it. From learning, if, if I'm capable of shuffling the frames into the right order again, I have probably understood much about this behavior. And it turns out that with that, you can actually learn a better posture representation, you can learn a better representation for the sequence, and this is then helpful for a lot of different tasks, like learning similarities of posture, learning similarities of behavior, and then analyzing, classifying behavior, and the like. In recent work, which appeared in Nature Communications a year ago, we then utilized that uh, for um, anal analysis, a visual analysis, which was coupled, coupled with an optogenetics experiment. So we had this animal having stroke on one hemisphere in the brain and then optogenetic um, uh, stimulation on the other hemisphere and observed the behavior based on a functional analysis like the one that I've shown you beforehand and established correlations between the two. There's more that we did there uh, going also in the direction of a direct treatment based on optogenetics, but this would definitely go beyond the scope um, of, of this talk here. So we can definitely take this offline You take a look at this publication. Now, with such a behavior analysis, you're then capable to take animals, like in the healthy state, and watch them two days after stroke here and in the recovery process. So this is here a long-term study over several weeks after stroke and um, or after some other uh, impairment that they had. And um, they are watched. They're analyzed, undergoing different treatments, and you can see the difference, not just in outcome, but also the difference in recovery of functional behavior, which is here fully automatically um, analyzed by means of this um, approach. 
over the recovery process and therefore mapped uh, onto the particular sort of uh, representation of the space that we have here. The approach can automatically sort of figure out which treatments are supposed to be a better one, which are worse, and adjust the treatment on the go. Now, last thing that I actually want to show here is um, an application or, or taking a little bit broader view on representational learning, and um, that is altering content, editing content in a context-aware manner. Now, what do I mean with that? Um, so far, I've showed you how self-supervision works, how we can learn like very fine-grained pointed um, metrics, how we can do a very detailed analysis and representation learning. And now I'd like to discuss how we can take this to a broader level so that we can actually translate one image into another image. So let's say you have this image here of Van Gogh and you would ask yourself how would he have seen himself or how would somebody like Gauguin have seen Van Gogh? Can you alter the style? Can you really translate from one image to another and therefore alter the content in a very peculiar manner which depends on the site information here which artist um, you actually want to consider? Now, style transfer has been pursued beforehand which is taking a content image, taking a target style, uh, like taking here Picasso or somebody else, and then saying, let's stylize this image. If I take another image coming from the same style, like this one here, and produce the output, you see a difference here. However, the style is the same and the output is different. That doesn't make much sense to me, and this is where we started off. I mean, so far, our community just said, like, oh, looks like a nice stylization. But as I said, like, I'm, I'm also, besides being a uh, faculty of math and CS, I'm also Department of Philosophy, and when I talk with colleagues there from art history and discuss things like that, they say, like, have you now stylized in a particular way? Why is the output so dramatically different? And sure enough, um, art historians like Ast Ernst Gombrich, for instance, also showed us that a style is really a collective spirit, meaning these images here sharing, having a lot of commonalities, then also means that at the end of the day, these outputs should be categorized together, should be highly related, highly similar, and not as diverse as what you see here. Now, how comes that the approaches so far cannot handle that, and how can we actually improve from that? How can you take a single content image, but a multitude of style images, rather than so far just a single one, and then each one produces a different output. How can we take a multitude of style images and make sure that the output is the same? First shot, average. <laughs> take these here, average. A is really looking like that, yeah? Some grayish or blackish output, not much content in there. And sure enough, I mean, a style, is not the average of the style images. I mean, there's not much that uh, remains there. How can we do better? Well, sure, I mean, uh, Gattis and Al and others are based on gram matrices. So you take the gram matrix of each of these style images there, and you, in one way or another, aggregate those. Ain't gonna work either. Uh, you still don't capture all the essence of a style, and what's more, I <laughs> A style is more than just an average of self-similarity matrices. Yeah, there's more to it. So we ask ourselves, how can we really come up with something that captures this, this essence of this style set there? And this brought us again to an encoder-decoder-like architecture, which had been there beforehand in our field. But the problem was that what relates the input, the content, and the stylization with respect to another so far, used to be fixed losses. Yeah? So people used here some similarity of the pixels and utilized a pre-trained perceptual loss, some neural network which tells you if the input and the output is similar. Now, if we want to really cater to this need of a stylization, the similarity should actually depend on the style, right? I mean, depending on what, what my glasses are which, with which I'm looking at the images, the similarity between input and output should also change. So this is exactly where we went. We adapted these losses based on the style images. We essentially learned a similarity while we were learning how to alter the style. But what's more, 
we actually wanted to make sure that we alter the content image here in a style-specific manner, rather than as beforehand, you're feeding all of that through the encoder. We took the output stylization and fed it into the encoder again and compared with the input. And that way made sure that we alter the input image here in a way which really depends on the stylization which you get here at the end, which really so you alter the image in a uh, content-aware manner, we called it here, or in, in, in a style-aware manner, you alter the content in a style-aware manner, that's why we called it style-aware content loss. Uh, so the way that your encoder here works depends on the stylization which you then actually produce. Applying this approach then helps you significantly in making the stylization of such a content image or this content image here depend on the true style. I should, uh, I mean, there's, there's much more than a single image that you actually have available. Here's our output, this is what you had beforehand. And you can see for abstract styles like this one down here, uh, previously you essentially had filters that just sort of were perturbing the image pixels in one way or another, but nothing that would really look or sort of live up to what's in this style, what's actually in this style. Um, the approach is capable of doing high resolution stylization. So if you take this content image here, render stylizations, which look really like that. And on PAL resolution, it works in 15 frames per second. So, and, and you can go much beyond that. So here's really like full HD resolution. I take this content image, render it in the style of Gauguin, Van Gogh, Picasso, here um, in, in much higher resolution than I can show you in this smallish landscape, and um, do this really in online fashion, uh, rendering all of these individual frames. You've probably seen some filters doing that, but bear in mind what I've shown you beforehand on the results that you're actually seeing here. And again, like I can only tell you, if you look at them in much higher resolution than this lousy projector can show, and this, this smallish uh, excerpt can show, you will probably um, uh, sort of admire the, 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 the beauty that there is to the pixels that are eventually created. Now, there is much more work that we've done in the humanities, um, which I cannot show uh, probably in this scope here, although I would love to. I do this typically on the other side of the Necker when I'm giving presentations there. Um, and so I want to uh, utilize this time now to, to wrap up a bit. Um, we've seen some uh, uh, several sort of takes on learning or teaching a machine to teach itself, to learn based on self-supervision. And I believe that this is highly crucial to regularize deep <coughs> neural networks which have millions of parameters so that they don't start overfitting and produce arbitrary results that we don't want. We've seen an approach based on deep reinforcement learning um, that actually helps to find the optimal tasks for self-supervision, that actually tells the machine how to self-supervise itself and not do this in a just random manner. I've showed you approaches to metric learning and representation learning, we coined them CLIC CNN, that contrary to what have, has been done beforehand, utilize only the reliable relationships. Approaches so far utilized all the data and then hope to gloss over the inconsistencies. We only utilize the reliable relationships, group them, and in particular utilize transitive relationships between them, establish more transitivities to kind of start from just a, a smallish fraction of the data and explain the relationships between all of them. And then um, we went into what we coined here um, dis um, disentangled representation learning, which allows us to really learn um, very sort of detailed representations of, for instance, posture or behavior, to disentangle the individual parts, to come up with explainable models that really describe what has been there in the pixel, in, in the images, that can actually alter them, edit, for instance, images in a context-aware manner, based on style or based on alterations in posture and so on. And with that, you can eventually come up with something even like a functional analysis of behavior, which is so detailed that you can find subtle differences, like I showed you, uh, as, as they occur during the recovery process of this animal after stroke. Now, 
Much of the thanks uh, go to a great group of really creative uh, students that I'm proud to sort of uh, collaborating with. It's really great work. Some of you I see here, great work collaborating with you. And uh, thanks to you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Maybe you can take your questions as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in this HD videos that we were watching, uh, you need, do you need to have some sort of correlation between a uh, temporal correlation between the frames so that if you process one frame yeah. and then you go a little bit forwards, uh, how do you yeah. know that the output is going to be similar enough that when you play the video, mm -hmm. it will be? Good question. We don't know. So this approach was really frame by frame stylization. And that was exactly the point, showing that the approach, that the results on a frame by frame manner are still consistent, showed us that we've probably done it in the right manner. So it's really done, fr each frame has been stylized in an independent manner. You could, <laughs> you could gloss over them or, or, or blur them or whatever. We didn't do that. This is really like each frame processed individually. Yeah? So I have plenty of questions, but I will try to keep it short. Um, when I think of learning to learn or meta-learning, uh, especially with regards to neural networks, mm -hmm. I think of things such as optimizing neural network topology, mm -hmm. like neuroevolution, mm -hmm. using some sort of genetic algorithm or genetic program, for example. In your case, you showed you were using convolutional neural networks. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with the right architecture and did you use some sort of hyperparameter tuning for these? Mm -hmm. Good question. So the point here was that um, so far a lot of learning approaches were about finding a better architecture and eventually having neural networks to tell you what the better architecture is. You've not seen much of that in my talk here. And the reason for that is that I'm not so much interested in changing uh, parameters of layers and adding another layer on top of network architecture that used to be there. There's been plenty of groups that did this and did and this is a very, uh, very tedious task of, of altering the network layers. I'm just afraid that one, after some point, does not learn too much from that. And what I find more interesting is coming up with principles which hopefully apply to arbitrary network architectures. And that's why I did not talk here much about the network architectures. And um, quite to the point, we've done many of these studies on different network architectures. So utilize the same learning algorithm, this is what we are interested in, and applied this on different network architectures. So you take a standard LXNet if you just want to have something which works quickly, and then you take a much deeper model and apply that on that, and the same learning algorithm still gets you home. Sure, you can get better performance if you add, I don't know, 500 layers on top of that, it's gonna cost you more, but I'm looking for things which are independent with respect to that. Yeah? <coughs> so actually, I <coughs> just to ask, um, does it mean that you can use a network that, in this case, you use a network that analyzes images? Mm -hmm. And could the same algorithm or easily analyze also the sort of audio input or medical data input? How easy is it transferable? So I showed a few examples where we had quite a set of diverse tasks. So entirely different data sets on which they were trained. The benefit of self-supervised training is that you can just take the data, but you don't need all of this tedious labeling process and take the same learning algorithm. I would not, if you have entirely different modality, just take a model that you've, in a self-supervised manner, trained on one data set and then apply it to an entirely different scenario. So if you're a trained specialist in analyzing MRIs, I would probably not go to some sonar data or something like that with that in your mind. You probably want to do some training on the other data as well. But this is exactly what self-supervision is for. Then you take the other data, also without uh, supervision, and you learn there. And if you do that, the same principle can be applied in different contexts and actually get you there. So that we have done. Doing this transfer by means of a pre-trained and fixed model to something else, there I have my doubts. But training on the different scenario with the same setup, yes, that should work. Yeah. Hey, Tim, what was your question? So, um, 
You mentioned self-supervised learning and unsupervised learning, yeah. and I'm confusing yeah. like both. So I was wondering why in the first part you more talked about self-supervised learning, and in the second part you were like last part more mm -hmm. about unsupervised learning. And so is it because you use the RL approach to mm -hmm. give you some kind of supervision? Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. So um, I hope I've done it there correctly, but in the second talk I typically talked about not having labels or not having supervision information, which I tried to also say at the beginning when I, s when I was talking about self-supervision, that I did this without having labels, without having manual um, supervision information. And I find this to be a more coined, uh, more clear explanation of what's actually going on. Yeah, either you have labels, you have supervision information, or you don't have it, or you have partial supervision information, in which case we typically call it semi-supervised learning. Now to the question of unsupervised and self-supervised learning, there are lots of approaches that try to do unsupervised learning, classical approaches from this realm as well, clustering approaches and so on, which also fall into this particular respect. And you've probably seen how different self-supervision what I'm showing you here is from a standard clustering approach, for instance, which falls into the category of unsupervised learning. And that's why I made this distinction in saying, like, compared to the larger body of, like, unsupervised learning approaches, like clustering, for instance, the self-supervised approaches are very peculiar and very different in, or are, are different in a, in a very particular way, which I showed with the surrogate tasks and the like. Um, they also don't require any labels, but in principle they work differently. So you have a large body of approaches that don't require any label, but they are sort of, uh, sort of bifurcating into different uh, sub-branches. Yeah? Um, talking about the, the CLEAT methodology yeah. one more time, so you showed the CLEAT CNN, those mm -hmm. can obviously referring to image data. Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of theoretical constraint that clique method approaches can only be applied to images? Or could you, for example, apply it to finding some sort of image similarity between documents? I don't see any, uh, any limitations which would bind them to images. I'm, however, highly excited about <laughs> images because I find visual data so enormously complicated and there's so much to learn from that, but I would be entirely open with respect to collaborations into entirely different angles there as well. It's just I'm heading a vision group and that's why I do have this focus on images, but that's the only thing I would surely love and I could also imagine a sort of um, applications somewhere else. Uh, besides teaching vision lectures here, I'm also teaching the AI course, and there we are uh, here or there also venturing into different territory where um, learning, where artificial intelligence is utilized on non-visual data. And as you said, there's surely like a lot of applications out there. You cannot do so many things at the same time. So if there's somebody of you interested in that, come to me. I would surely like to, to talk also about other modalities there. Yeah. How realistic do you see uh, for this technology to get into a product like uh, Apple Photos or uh, Google, whatever the product is called, uh -huh. for, uh, for classifying pictures either for, uh, on a personal level uh -huh. or on a uh, marketing uh -huh. uh, department uh -huh. level or something like that? I do have discussions. <laughs> I do have yeah. discussions on that. and. Um, uh, with companies and also with just institutions, like especially in the in the field also of art history, things where you would not imagine that, like there is like large databases that are actually highly interested in that. And then there's like the uh, key players which you probably first imagined, and yeah, we're discussing about this as well. So how many years? <laughs> <laughs> I hope soon. <laughs> uh, things typically don't progress as quickly as I hope <laughs> they do, but uh, I hope soonish. Yeah. Really good question. You know this based on the data that you actually feed it. If you feed it a data set where you have a lot of variability in background clutter and, and the persons there, are there, and so on, and um, they also show differences in posture, but this is what you really into it. Yeah, you have hopefully enough variations in your background clutter that your model then picks up. Hey, background clutter cannot be what describes the commonalities. That's what you get it from. 
if I, however, would just show you disintegrated data, then there's eventually nothing to actually pick up from this data set as well. So here it is the posture that you actually get by that. There are a few other tweaks that you could also do to prime it um, if you have flawed data, but hopefully, assuming that we're in a big data scenario, this is not an issue, and with the disentangling that I showed you, even less. I've seen some other questions. Here, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert in these topics, and also, uh, I'm not sure. This is I also topic. try to learn how learning works. So. <laughs> no, I, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, AI in, in general. But when we're talking about the cross-model um, AI, so where we have the flow information from the pictures and also the image themselves. Uh, do, does this process go work backward? Like we were projecting both of these data sets into the same space to see how close they were, because we wanted to, to have the same output mm -hmm. for the flow information and for the image information, if I understood correctly. Mm -hmm. Can you then uh, go work backwards and say, oh, I have this image, and I predict that the flow information, uh, which would give me the same output or a close output, mm -hmm. this one mm -hmm. would be, would look like this. Can you work backwards mm -hmm. the network? Mm -hmm. or so what I've shown you in this talk is projecting it ba back into the location domain, onto x, y location, so to speak. So you take one or you take both of the modalities and go back into the other modality or into both modalities and then show at the particular location where you believe that the interesting action actually happens. So so you take the, the RGB input, for instance, and go into the flow and say, at this pixel there in the flow, I think that interesting things happen. Okay. You could, as you said, then also turn the synthesis approaches that we had beforehand, then turn things around and even do a rendering there. We haven't, in this particular paper, explored that one. We've just localized the information, but not altered that in the okay. other channel. Yeah. That would be really interesting. Same th question as beforehand. I, <laughs> before I went too much into computer vision earlier on, I was also very much interested in that particular topic. I then, however, figured out that building robots also takes a lot of time, sometimes even more time than building vision systems that work. And especially when vision systems break, you can save them and can go back uh, with robots, <laughs> you need to do a lot of soldering to get that fixed. And that's why I figured like doing all of that at the same time is tricky. So um, I presently uh, don't have any direct collaboration in this, in this angle of applying that. I however thought exactly of that because this would be a great way to sort of turn this process around and go really into reality to see what that actually means. So I would be really interested in actually getting that together. I thought about this as well. So far, just did not get to that. Yeah, but that would be really cool to get that going. Yeah. Would it be possible for you to expand this method into three dimension and then use it for fMRI analysis? Mm -hmm. uh, what particular part are you interested in then? Ah. and then they recreate basically a video that should be similar to their dream. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. that could be interesting. That, that would be really interesting. As you know, you have a certain latency if you go for MRI. Then the second question, I yeah, I mean the latency is one, one issue, depending on behavior that you, for instance, would be wa uh, watching then in parallel. Um, is the latency really an issue? Um, we did have this in a few experiments that we did not with M fMRI, but other recordings. And um, hmm. the 3D volume makes me a bit worried. And the resolution in that case, this being too coarse, I, either the temporal being too coarse or the spatial resolution being too coarse to really get the correlations going that we're looking for. Um, or you really need to know where to look, in which case you could then limit the spatial volume to get the temporal resolution right. So I guess you need to have a pretty good hypothesis beforehand what you're looking for, and then that can potentially work. But 
let's say like the, the ultimate goal, you take the entire brain, <laughs> just do the mapping and then we'll do <laughs> I, I doubt that uh, fMRI recording technology is presently at this stage, at least not from what I've seen so far. Yeah? Um, yeah, I mean just um, for example, you can record activities in the waking cortex yeah. and then you can expand this method into three dimensions. Basically you pick up uh, um, voxels, yeah. but Yeah. And then you analyze the pattern the same manner as you do here with phosphorus. Exactly, instead yeah. Instead you analyze activity patterns. Yeah, exactly. But what I was hinting at is um, vision is slow, but compared to fMRI, it's still fast, right? And that there is a lot of things going on, which <laughs> in fMRI means a lot of spatial resolution that you need. And if you then go just for the consumption of energy and the resulting products, which is what you can measure in fMRI, I have my doubts that this is sufficient to actually really do this. So in essence, like I, all of these questions, like <laughs> taking tomogra tomographic data of that sense is a little bit like taking one of these hall probes, stitching this to your computer, and then with that wanting to tell if like Microsoft Word is running and what somebody has typed on their screen. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, I know that there's a lot of things going on in that, in that direction, and I have a lot of respect for people that actually can tweak things in that direction, but I think you need a lot of extra constraints to really make these things uh, going on. And without that's what I meant. Uh, if, if you have all of that site information, then probably it's going to work. And there's much more work needed from the other end, <laughs> from my end, to, to get you into that realm and, and working.